Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Congratulations, gentlemen. Um, Mr. Papillon, tell me the definition of a motion in limine. A motion in limine, in some law books it doesn't exist, Senator, but what it is is it is a motion filed um, in advance of trial to get a ruling in limine, which means in advance of some issue that may come up in the trial, usually an evidentiary issue. I thought you might know. Thank you. Um, Judge Person, explain to me the various definitions that the U.S. Supreme Court has used to, to uh, define a fundamental right. In, in Glucksburg, and even recently in Dobbs, the Supreme Court has really focused on two major issues. One, whether the right in question is deeply rooted in our history and tradition. And the court is also focused on whether it is implicit in the concept of ordered liberty. And I also believe that in Glucksburg, they described the need for the right to be uh, clearly defined. Um. How does that relate to, to, to the discussion in Griswold of a penumbra? Well, obviously, Griswold, as you state, points out this concept of the penumbra, rights that are not explicitly enumerated, but that the court is otherwise found. As a sitting magistrate judge, and if I was fortunate to become a district judge, I would, of course, follow the guidance of the Supreme Court, who has identified just a few relatively small number of those rights. Um, obviously, the right to privacy um, perhaps being, being the most well-known. Well, can, can you have, what does the, the Supreme Court said about um, the existence of a fundamental right that is not part of our history and tradition? For example, when the court uh, delved into the Second Amendment, um, it, was, it was really, the opinions were almost written as if they were historians as opposed to judges, but part of our history and tradition was, was a fundamental part of their, of their discussion. Does the right have to be part of our history and tradition to be fundamental? Well, I can say this, that in, in Heller, McDonald, and Bruin, that was the focus. That's what the court looked at. Now, there are other cases throughout history that have recognized a few other rights, the right to, to marry, for example. Uh, and I can't speak to the specific um, methodology that was used, but I will say, at least in the Second Amendment context, that focus on history was critically important. OK. All right. Um, Let me move uh, to Mr. Daniel. Um, can, the, can, can, can a police officer um, – well, let me, show, let, me, let me try this another way. If I'm walking down the street and a police officer wants to, 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 to stop and talk to me, can he just stop and talk to me for any reason? Senator, you can seek your consent to stop and talk to you. What if I don't consent? If you don't consent, then the officer needs to have a reasonable articula articulable suspicion that a crime has been committed, will be committed, and be able to articulate that to justify the stop. Okay. Then how come police officers can set up a roadblock and stop 500 people to see if they have liability insurance? My understanding is that the Supreme Court has ruled that those types of stops, um, when generally applied, are conducive to good order and policing. Why? They're still stops, aren't they? Senator, um, in my eight and a half years as a prosecutor, I've not had to litigate the adequacy. I know. I'm just asking you what you think. I mean, <laughs> isn't that pretty intrusive? What if I'm in a hurry to pick up my kid from school? And I don't have time to wait for 10 minutes. 
and I don't want to wait anyway. Why? Why? <laughs> if a cop can't just stop me on the street, why can they can they stop me and check my insurance? Senator, um, as far as my personal belief, I haven't encountered that. I'm um, just asking you legally, why can they do that? Um, again, I don't. <laughs> I haven't encountered that issue, so I don't have the research on that, Senator. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Senator Welch. 